Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on synaptic mechanisms. In this video, we are still discussing the function of synaptotagmin. And the reason we're going through this so slowly is because this really is an area of active research. And uh, the function of synaptotagmin is not rock-solid fact, basically. Okay, so I want to present a lot of experimental assays that you can do to back up what I'm saying. Uh, and that's why we're going through this so slowly. So we're going to now look at um, synaptotagmin binding to phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate, or PIP2. Right, so let me explain the setup again. Here is our synaptic vesicle here, docked to the plasma membrane here through these core snare complexes. So let me draw these nice and quickly. So we have synaptobrevin 2, which is this uh, V snare, and we'll have that in orange. So in orange here we have synaptobrevin 2, two synaptobrevin 2 molecules there. So this is synaptobrevin 2, synapto Brevin 2, and it's an example of a V snare because it is in the vesicular membrane. Okay, now uh, this other uh, snare protein here, which is in the membrane of the uh, cell, in the plasma membrane, is known as syntaxin 1, so that's in blue there. So this is syntaxin 1. Okay, so syntaxin 1. And then finally, another snare protein, uh, that's a T snare, it's in the target membrane, i.e. the plasma membrane in this case, and it provides two alpha helices into this core snare complex here. This is SNAP25, and we'll have SNAP25 in this turquoise colour here. Okay, so SNAP25 there. Right, and overall what happens is these uh, snare proteins together provide four alpha helices, which are uh, going into the cytoplasm. And what happens is these alpha helices wrap up together, and basically it, the wrapping up starts at these free tips and then makes its way down in the so-called zipper mechanism. Zipper mechanism. And basically you zip up these alpha helices together, which has the result of pulling this membrane of the vesicle very close to the membrane of the plasma membrane, and that docks uh, the synaptic vesicle at the plasma membrane. Now, when calcium goes up, the calcium rise is sensed by a protein that we have met already called synaptotagmin. And I just want to say, synaptotagmin, it may have a very similar name to synaptobrevin, but it is not a snare protein. Synaptotagmin is not a snare protein. It's kind of just trivial nomenclature, but it's not a snare protein. Snare proteins stand for the SNAP receptor, and uh, synaptotagmin has no business binding to SNAP. Okay. Right, so here is syn uh, synaptotagmin up here in pink. And remember, synaptotagmin has this membrane-spanning alpha helix here, and then these two C2 domains up here, uh, known as the C2A domain, the one that's closer to the vesicle, and then the C2B domain, the one that's further away from the vesicle. Right, so we've already seen that when calcium um, goes up in the vicinity of this synaptotagmin, what's going to happen is that free calcium ions are going to bind to the C2A domain, and two calcium ions are going to bind to the C2B domain. Okay, this is going to activate the synaptotagmin, and we've seen that synaptotagmin will bind to first the syntaxin 1, uh, the snare protein uh, in the target membrane, the plasma membrane. Secondly, it will bind to phosphatidylserine uh, molecules in the plasma membrane via the C2A domain, specifically the C2A will bind to the phosphatidylserine. And now what we're going to see is that C2B will also bind to a lipid component of the phospholipid by there, and C2B, C2B binds to this PIP2 molecule. Okay, so I want to have a little bit of a discussion of the structure of PIP2, because it's one of these molecules that generally people have heard of. It's very, very important in signaling pathways in biology. Um, but it's generally not something that people actually know what it is if you ask them. So I will write out its full name. Its full name is phosphatidyl inositol. So that's the P there is for phosphatidyl. Inositol is the I, the next I here. And then 
five bisphosphate. And this bisphosphate is the P2 on the end, okay? Right, so now I want to discuss with you the structure of phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. So, we know that the plasma membrane is what is known as a phospholipid bilayer. It's made up of two layers of phospholipids, where the two layers are oppositely oriented, so that both the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids up here, in this outer leaflet, as we call it, which is the uh, layer that faces the extracellular fluid over here, the ECF for short. So this is the outer leaflet. Okay, so that both the um, uh, hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids in the outer leaflet and the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids in the inner leaflet, which is the uh, layer of phospholipids which faces the cytoplasm in here, so this is the cytoplasm, also known as cytosol, okay, uh, both those hydrophobic tails are together in this hydrophobic core of the phospholipid bilayer, and the polar heads, which are negatively charged, face out either to the extracellular fluid or to the cytoplasm. So let's draw one of these phospholipids in here. So phospholipids are often drawn in cartoon with this sort of a structure. So let me discuss this with you. So these two lines here, these two vertical lines which I've coloured in orange, uh, those represent the long chain carboxylic acids which are esterified to the first and the second hydroxyl groups of the glycerol, which forms like the backbone of the phospholipid. So these are the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipid. Okay, and as I say, they are formed from esterifying fatty acids, or what chemists would call long-chain carboxylic acids. So fatty acids is what biochemists would use. Uh, proper chemists would use long-chain carboxylic acids. Okay, um, <clears throat> so um, fatty acids is still very pervasive among biochemistry, even though the, um, r uh, the hardcore chemists are trying to uh, change the name. Right, so you have these long-chain carboxylic acids. It's sterified onto this glycerol molecule, which forms the backbone of our phospholipids. So I've drawn the glycerol molecule in green here. It's this horizontal line. So this is the glycerol molecule. Now again, glycerol is what a biochemist would call this. A hardcore chemist would call this propane 1, 2, 3, triol. So 1, 2, 3, triol. And the advantage of the chemist's name is that um, is that this actually tells you exactly what that molecule is, whereas glycerol doesn't tell you anything. Uh, if you know what propane is and you know what all means, then you can work out what this structure is if you know basic chemistry. Okay, whereas glycerol, you just have to learn the name. Okay, and then finally, off the third hydroxyl group of glycerol, you then have this phosphate group stuck on here. So this is this phosphate group here. Phosphate. Right, so the whole molecule now, this glycerol molecule with two long-chain carboxylic acids bound to it and a phosphate group bound to it is what is known as a phospholipid. Okay, so this is a phospholipid. And the old name for a phospholipid, or the biochemist's name for a phospholipid, is a phosphatidate molecule. Phosphatidate molecule. Now, why am I telling you these old names? Well, phosphatidate is helpful because it's going to help us understand what this is, phosphatidyl. So basically, this molecule, PIP2, is just a modified phospholipid. It's just a normal old phospholipid with an extra bit stuck onto the head, basically. So let me show you how you modify phosphatidate to turn it into phosphatidylinositol. 4,5-bisphosphate. So here is our phosphatidate molecule um, drawn out again. So in red, oops, in red here we have our phosphate group. In green here we have our glycerol molecule. And in orange we have these um, hydrophobic tails or these long chain carboxylic acids which are esterified with our glycerol molecule. Okay, now that's phosphatidate. How are we going to turn it into phosphatidyl inositol, which we need up here? Well, we need to know what inositol is. Inositol is a six-carbon ring. So I will denote this by a hexagon here. Okay, so it's a six-carbon ring. 
where of every single one of the carbons in this six carbon ring, you have a hydroxyl group coming off. So here in blue, I will denote this inositol ring. So it's a six-membered carbon ring where all of the carbons have um, single bonds amongst them. So let me draw its uh, skeletal structure over here. Okay, so I'd draw it like so. Oops, whoops. I'd draw it like so if I was drawing its skeletal structure. So I'd draw it exactly how I've drawn it down there. Uh, hexagon, remember in skeletal structures you don't show carbons. These corners mean carbon. Now these are all single bonds between those six carbons. And then you have to show non-carbon molecules. But you don't show hydrogen atoms at all which are bound to carbon molecules. So that makes inositol structure nice and easy to draw. It looks very easy if you draw it like this, whereas if you draw the molecular formula, it looks slightly scarier. So that's really nice and obviously symmetric, whereas if you have to show all the hydrogens coming off, it just makes it look messier. So each of these carbons here does also have another hydrogen coming off, but we don't show that in the skeletal formula because it just makes it look messy. So this basically is what inositol actually is. So it's this beautifully... Um, beautifully uh, rotationally symmetric molecule. So, you take one of these hydroxyl groups and you form a phosphoester link between that hydroxyl group and the phosphate group uh, that's bound to um, the glycerol over here. Okay, that gives you phosphatidyl inositol. So, so far we have discussed the structure of phosphatidyl inositol. So, this is the inositol and it's linked to this phosphatidyl group, which is when you have a phosphatidate molecule stuck onto something, it's known as a phosphatidyl group. So this is the phosphatidyl group stuck onto inositol here. Now, we want a molecule slightly more advanced than phosphatidyl inositol. We want phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. So, we need to add extra phosphate groups onto this inositol molecule. So, where do you add these? Well, you add them onto the fourth and the fifth carbon. So, here's the first carbon bound to this first phosphate group here. Then we count second, third, here's the fourth over here. So, we add a phosphate group onto the fourth, and then we add a phosphate group onto the fifth. Now, if you were to look at that molecule, what would you name it? Because I wouldn't name it phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. I would have named it phosphatidyl inositol 3,4-bisphosphate. I would have called this the third carbon. However, someone long ago decided that when they looked at this molecule, they would label the carbons of the inositol ring here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and they call this one the fifth one. For some reason, they did that, and we are stuck with it. And if anyone knows the answer as to why it's called 4,5-bisphosphate and not 3,4-bisphosphate, do leave a comment. I'd be very pleased to know. Okay, right, so this is the structure of PIP2, phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. And I hope what I've convinced you is that it's just a modified phospholipid. It's just a phospholipid with this thing stuck off the edge, uh, stuck off the end. So it's just got a extra little bit stuck onto it, basically. Now, what's going to happen, going back to this picture up here, is when calcium comes and binds to the C2A and C2B domains, that causes the, um, the um, electrical potential of these two domains to go up, basically, because you're adding in positive charge, and positive charge gives you a positive electrical potential. So the electrical potential of these two domains goes up, that is the only change that happens to these two C2 domains. You do not get any other conformational change. All that changes is the electrical potential of them. Right. And what's going to happen is this C2B domain is now going to bind to PIP2 molecules, which I'll denote like this, in the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. Okay, so... How shall I colour in this phospholipid bilayer? Uh, sorry, this PIP2 molecule. I'll denote it in yellow. That's a colour I don't use very often. Okay, so in yellow here, that is our PIP2 molecule uh, in the phospholipid bilayer. And basically, our C2B domain is going to bind to that. And that's also going to help bring uh, this 
well, what's, it, what's actually going to happen, what we'll see in uh, upcoming videos when we put it all together and actually see the function of synaptotagmin, what actually happens is it causes this membrane to bulge out, basically. You get like a little molehill um, forming into the cytoplasm, a little invagination of the plasma membrane into the cytoplasm. And this sort of invagination, which I might even draw on here, this sort of little invagination is going to bring this membrane closer and closer to the plasma membrane. And obviously, I've drawn this off the side, but if this happens right in the center, if you get a molehill forming here, then that's going to bring these two membranes very close together, and that's believed to, that's at least uh, a very strong contender for how synaptotagmin causes um, the, um, the fusion of the vesicle with the uh, plasma membrane. And I want to stress, it's not just the C2B domain binding to PIP2 that does this, but also the C2A domain binding to uh, phosphatidylserine, PS, um, in the plasma membrane. Okay, so we'll call it there for this video. In the next video, what we'll do is we'll look at an assay that you can do in order to show that synaptotagmin binds to PIP2.